reversed. Greetings, I'm Shad. And I've actually wanted to make a video on the rule of cool for quite a while. The thing that's given me the best opportunity is that we're currently filming the short film adaptation of my novel, Shadow of the Conqueror. And in the process of shooting this film, I've literally had direct first-hand experience with the very problem that I want to address with you. And it is the inherent danger and problem with what can happen when you're dealing with the rule of cool. So to start us off, what really is the rule of cool? It's pretty self-explanatory by the terms, and it's that sometimes we want to have something in a story, film, TV show, because it's awesome. And that's a great justification. If you can add something that is just has the cool factor, of course you want to bring it in. The rule of cool manifests in so many aspects, from fight scenes, to world building, to weapon design even, even sound effects. But there is a danger with it, and it's when it can go too far. For the rule of cool to really work, whatever thing you're doing to raise the coolness factor, it either cannot sacrifice too much believability or realism, and realism is an important topic, functionality. You can push it to certain levels and, and get away with certain elements of unrealism because the coolness is so great, people don't even notice what it's actually overriding to achieve it. But if you push it too far, where it's actually contradicting something really important, like a plot point in the story, like how the laws of physics work, how practical design is, it can go so far where suddenly, instead of getting the cool factor, the reaction is, that is incredibly dumb. Best example, and this is where the rule of cool factor has failed, uh, one of the best, there's many examples, but have a look at the uh, Star Destroyers that are rising out of the ground in uh, the last, no, Rise of Skywalker or something like that. It was a bad movie. I didn't like it. And uh, there's a scene in it where Star Destroyers burst out of the ground like zombies. And it was a very visually impressive scene. And I'm almost convinced that they put it in the film because they thought it looked awesome. But my response wasn't awesome. It was like, what's going on? Why? Why were they buried? Were they made in the ground? If they made them, did they bury them in the ground? Or were they made in the ground? It was so bafflingly dumb and strange that it just threw me out of the film. And this is a clear prime example of when you are prioritizing a coolness factor without trying to justify it can be a horrible addition to whatever story or movie you're making. So it's important. And I want to talk more about that and ways to fix it, okay? The way the rule of cool should be approached to have it work better in your own storytelling, whatever that is. And indeed, the reason why I'm standing on this set right now is that I've had recent experiences that have helped me put into practice the very thing I'm going to be teaching to you to, and show you from a real world example that it works. And the reason why I have this best opportunity to really talk about this is I'm standing on the set of the short film adaptation of my novel, Shadow of the Conqueror, and we are filming it right now. We have filmed fight scenes in this set and it is turning out brilliantly. It's really exciting and so it's happening and uh, it's great. And one of these experiences that I'm talking about happened right here where the fight scene was filmed. And it's also why I'm holding the prop of Imperius. Now it looks brilliant but there's going to be some really awesome, you know, digital effects added to it in post and so it's going to be looking great. But Imperius is also an example of the rule of call that I'm going to get to. So now I've actually been out to experience what I'm talking about in multiple ways. I'm an author, but now also being on the set of the film production, seeing how we can use the methods I'm going to explain to you and implement them to fix the problems, address the rule of call, uh, has really helped me understand it in a, in a larger measure and uh, hopefully about to share it with you. Now, if this has piqued your interest at all in knowing a little bit more of the larger story of Shadow of the Conqueror and how this short film will fit into it and all these things, there is a way you can actually get my novel for free because as luck would have it, this video is sponsored by Audible. If you go to www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity and try Audible for 30 days, you can get your first audiobook for free. And that book, of course, I recommend the audio version of my novel, Shadow of the Conqueror. It's narrated by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding, two of the best audiobook narrators in the world. It's phenomenal and uh, you can get it for free. But not only that, you'll get access to the Audible Plus catalog, 
which gives you a wide range of like curated selected audiobooks but not only that podcasts sleep tracks self-help audiobooks a wide range of content that you get access to instantly when you sign up to audible for 30 days I personally feel that the audiobook is the best version to enjoy my novel, so I really highly recommend it. And if you haven't tried audiobooks before, I genuinely think you're missing out. I've listened to them for years. I was signed up for Audible before they were ever a sponsor, and I have hundreds of audiobooks that I was able to get at a fraction of their retail price due to how their system works. Because when you sign up, you get a monthly credit, and that monthly credit is far more affordable than the retail price of my own audiobook. And so I've been able to get hundreds of audiobooks at a fraction of the cost, so the value is phenomenal. And if you go to www.audible.com forward slash Shadowversity, or if you're in the US, you text Shadowversity to 500 500, you can get Shadow of the Conqueror for free if you sign up for 30 days. So thank you for Audible for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to uh, the issue with the rule of cool and how we can fix it. So the first thing that I want to address is kind of the scale of uh, what you need to sacrifice. Sometimes you don't need to sacrifice anything at all, uh, just a little flair of uh, whatever it is, and it raises the cool factor. For instance, I like swords. That's cool. I have a warrior, I have a sword. To me, that increases the cool factor and I'm not sacrificing anything. So there are small elements of the rule of cool that require no sacrifice at all. Then there are ones that the trade-off is so minute that no one really notices. For instance, have you noticed that a lot of space shows have sound in space with the spaceships and explosions? That doesn't happen, sound doesn't exist in space, okay? There's no atmosphere set for the sound waves to, waves to travel. Yet by adding the impact and explosion of many you know, spaceships and everything like that, it creates a more dramatic and engaging experience for the intentions that the show or movie was trying to achieve. This is important because a more realistic kind of space show, say like Gravity or Interstellar, might be more appropriate to have no sound in space to emphasize kind of the deadness, the softness, okay, where there's no sound and everything. And so it doesn't apply always, but sometimes sound in space is not only really enjoyable, in certain instances, you could almost say, uh, give an argument that it's needed to enhance the impact uh, and convey what's actually happening to the audience. And for that trade-off, I've never really seen a problem. Here's an example on Imperius itself in terms of functionality and practicality. Now, for in a real practical sword design, there would be no need for the additional quillins on Imperius. All you need is one here and one here, and that achieves its purpose. Any additional one is just adding unneeded weight, and it would make a more cumbersome sword. Now, the thing is, this is such a small detail that it won't break too many people's immersions when they're watching it because there's a cool factor with the additional quillins, and it was in the reflection of the design. Imperius was made to reflect a flaring sun, and these were the sunbeams coming from a central core. And so that was the cool factor that I felt, and it doesn't apply to everyone. There is a certain level of personal preference into what is cool for every individual, but uh, that was the cool factor I was going for in the design. Now, if there wasn't a way to justify it in the world, which there is, it's still so small that you could push it and get away with it. And you could say, well, they're hollow on the inside or the additional weight is so minute it doesn't matter and you could get away with it. Now, there's a couple of other impractical elements in the design. The blade is very wide, okay, uh, which would make it more cumbersome. Um, and so there are those elements as well. But then this is easily justified in the narrative. And this is where we get to the important thing about justifying the cool factors that you're adding in. And it's the fact that the type of magical sword that Imperius is, they, act, they can be made out of any material and they keep the weight of the material they're made out of. And the justification is that the swept hilt here was actually carved out of wood, really light, but when it was sun forged, which gives it its magical properties, it becomes basically indestructible. Um, uh, it retains its original weight and so these additional quillins doesn't impact the functionality and weight of the weapon at all. There, we achieved it. That isn't hugely important because it's a small detail and it's not gonna break too many people's immersion. But there are larger details when we get to kind of the, oh, by the way, someone kind of was thrown into this and broken glass and everything else, the action fight scene. Um, going back to what I was saying, there are clearly elements in the rule of cool when you really start to push the line, like we're getting to the Star Destroyers rising out of the ground. And that's where, when you get to something like that, which is so far beyond practical, believable, that's when you need to ground it. Now, what is practical or realistic, really, 
in fiction, especially fantasy. And people say, what, you're gonna question how physics operates in a world with magic? That's a disingenuous criticism because you need believability in the story you're sharing for the stakes. If there are no implications or weight to the events that happen, anything can happen, there's no rules, most audiences are not gonna be properly invested in the story, okay? And to be invested in the story, you need stakes. And stakes, there needs to be implications, cause and effects. You feel this is going to happen unless something happens to stop it. And if the show is always showing that thing not happening, for instance, if someone raises a gun to someone and it's loaded and it's ready to fire, the implication just based on the real world, if the trigger is pulled, a bullet most of the time is gonna shoot out. Now, if suddenly a movie has it that this, everyone is able to get shot and whenever the gun is pointed at the hero, they pull the trigger and it misfires and it happens multiple times and then the ultimate kind of showdown, if the bad guy then pulls out a gun and points it at our hero, we're not going to have any investors. They have too much plot armor. We're not afraid for them and so there's no stakes. And so the ideas of cause and effect and that there is internal logic to what is happening is actually really important in a story. So it's not about what is going on in the story needs to reflect the real world I, perfectly. No, 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 it's not that. It's that it needs to be consistent with its own rules. And it's fine if um, the show, movie, story that you're making has different laws of physics or people are more durable. There's multiple things. You just need to establish the rules of the world in which the story is operating. There's another element that's going to be important in terms of what is really going to be believable, acceptable or passable in whatever story you're doing. And it's actually the audience expectation and standard of the story that you're making. And you're thinking, hang on, different stories and things have different standards? Yeah, they do. And sometimes these standards are created through past works in the same genre. Sometimes they're created through the audience perception. Uh, multiple things create the standards, but they exist. There is a different expectation when you go in and watch a Fast and Furious movie compared to when you go in and watch Lord of the Rings. And so the ridiculous things that happen in Fast and the Furious, we know it's for fun and uh, they're not caring about, you know, laws of physics and all that stuff because the film is trying to achieve a different purpose. But for a story that is trying to be more dramatic and wants more tension in the payoff and all these things and more immersion and more believability, suddenly it becomes very important to be consistent with the rules you're establishing. A perfect example of this are, are actually the uh, fight scenes you see in a lot of Asian cinema, martial art flicks. I will refer to, say, Jackie Chan, The Legend of Drunken Master. There is a, a huge, very unrealistic element to the film, and it is the truly insane durability of the primary character and the other characters. Uh, in reality, a very solid punch from a person, bare knuckled, can do serious damage and then being hit with a bottle or something else can knock someone out in one hit. Yet in these fight scenes, we are seeing people get hit and hit and hit and hit and hit, and they're never going down. They're superhumans. Why do we accept that? There's a different standard for those films, and we can just go along with it, and it's fine, it's a martial arts flick. I don't expect award-winning acting. It would be nice. It would improve the quality of these films if there was award-winning acting in them, okay? But I don't expect that, because I go into those films to watch great fight action and my standard that I'm applying is different. Yet there is a level, isn't there, okay? Because we still expect certain things to operate the way they do. So pretend you have this Jackie Chan fight scene and one of the bad guys picks up a sword, not a magical one like Imperius, but picks up a sword and we see in the fight scene a clear hit right on the chest that goes all the way down. And Jackie Chan gets hit and he moves back, or Drunken Master, however you want to refer to him, and he gets up and there is no cut on him at all. And we see previous or later in the fight scene, this sword cutting through wood and big things. Do you see the problem that's arising here? You, it's clear, okay, there's a, what, that is, what we're seeing is a massive incon inconsistency and plot hole. This sword was shown as sharp, so then why didn't it cut through Jackie Chan? And so there is a level of durability that we're willing to grant Jackie Chan in this fight scene and a level that we're not based on our natural understanding of how things should work. Okay, he can take a lot of hits, but we don't expect that he would be able to resist a sword slash on the chest and it not do any damage. We still have a standard. And so if something like that happened, there would need to be an in-world explanation 
Otherwise, it's a massive and profound plot hole that will rip people out of the film that they're watching and they're just going to be thinking, scratching their head and whatever tension that you're trying to build in the fire scene is subverted and it becomes a problem. And this is the problem with the rule of cool because guess what? Stuff like that, though the Jackie Chan example, you know, to my knowledge, hasn't happened. But I mean, for instance, there are elements of unrealism with sword fights where they get cut and the cut isn't deep enough and so on superficial and they keep fighting all that stuff. Anyway, so there's that example. But there are other examples that are comparable to the uh, Jackie Chan one that I just gave. One that I saw recently was actually in the Loki TV series. And it was about consistency in power scale. Loki, in this show, spoilers, not really spoilers, because he, you, well, guess what? Loki fights people. Is that a spoiler? Yeah, I think you could expect that. He fights people. But he fights people that, to, in the context of the show, shouldn't really have powers. Security guards or regular people in a shopping center, okay? Or a supermarket. And he struggles to fight them. This was odd, because Loki got a beating from the Hulk and survived. He went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thor, and so his power level was actually really, really high, as established in previous shows. Yet he struggled with these other, you know, people that he fought with in, in, in the show Loki. And it totally ripped me out of the show, because it was so inconsistent with the power level that Loki was supposed to have and has been established. Now, they wanted Loki to struggle. That was the cool factor. They wanted the fight to be engaging and difficult for him, and they felt, I'm assuming they felt that would be better. And so they made the people that he was fighting unusually effective against Loki in this instance, and they didn't explain it. And that was just as to why, how this was working, where's Loki's power levels, and it was just, for me, a complete mess that in one portion of the show really pulled me out. Well, here's the interesting thing. There was a part in the choreography of the fight scene that we have filmed in this very set. And my criticism for Loki and many other things that sometimes all you need is a single line to explain the question that is hanging in the air. And these questions that are created from what we're seeing sometimes are really important because if not answered satisfyingly, it's like, just what's going on? It pulls us out of the show. That's not what you want to happen. And I've often said, it doesn't take too much questions. For instance, there is a massive astronomical plot hole in the Snyder Cut of the Justice League. And I'm talking next, like, I can't believe how they let this go through all the way. It's a minor spoiler, but it's at the very beginning of uh, the Snyder Cut. And it's that Darkseid, it turns out Darkseid has been searching for Earth for something. I won't say what it is. And he originally found it in this first battle. And when he was defeated, he forgot where Earth was. And I was like, hang on, what? You're telling me Darkseid with, you know, universe spanning technology. He, ha he can travel the stars. He has a legion of followers. No one wrote down where Earth was and they just forgot? It is like the most astronomical, dumb, dumb moment of the film. And it's not the only one, but it's just one amongst many. And that's a big problem. And, and I'm not the only one who knows. So many people have been like teasing and making fun of the film for that thing. By the way, do you like the portrait of Dalis the Conqueror? I think it looks brilliant. Um, and so it's hanging the air, it's not answered. And the, and the answer they usually give, like, why couldn't Dark why, did, why didn't Darkseid come back? Why did it take so long? It's like, the answer was he forgot. And it's like, are you kidding me? And this is my problem. You could have answered this with a single line. There is exposition in the film many times where it could have, and it's just one line could have answered it completely. Okay, after the defeats of the heroes, when Darkseid invaded, the, there's gods there with magic, they got together and they literally moved the position of Earth. And by the way, Earth has moved, like I think even Superman has moved Earth in the comics at one point. There's ways you could justify it better. Move the Earth. That was my first idea. And then another idea, because the, the more you can integrate the explanation for pre-existing world building and what has happened before it, the more you can justify it and sell it to the audience. And a brilliant way to justify it, well, guess what? Invisibility exists in the DC universe at the moment, okay? Themyscira is covered in a shield of invisibility. Wonder Woman says she learns invisibility. And I do not, look, I'm not a fan of 1984, Wonder Woman 1984, but she even learns the invisibility uh, in the movie. And it's established that who can do it? Zeus knows the invisibility thing. And so the answer is, Zeus cast an invisibility spell either over Earth or over the solar system. 
to protect them from dark side being able to find them again. Because the solar system, by the way, is moving as the galaxy is moving. And so you could say it's moved position, they can't be able to find it because of the invisibility. And so Zeus summoned all the power he could and cast an invisibility shell around it. And look, that's what you need, you know. If for the, because of the threat of dark side, Zeus summoned all his power and cast the greatest invisibility spell he'd ever cast, just like what was done for the island of Themyscira, shrouding the solar system in a cloak of invisibility, protecting it from dark side. That's the line. Done. It was that easy. And I have said you could fix problems like this with a single line multiple times. Well, guess what? As we were prepping for the fight scene in this, you know, uh, set, I saw one of those problems. And I was committed to approach the short film uh, looking for problems just like I've criticised in films the whole time. I should not be any, you know, exemption from my own criticisms because, of course, again, I want to see this short film be done to the best level possible. And the problem was this. The first beginning element of the fight scene started with something, I'm not going to give spoilers, but started with something that meant the main character struggled to fight them. Things were switched up in the order, and that thing happened later in the fight scene. The main character, Dalen, it's not exactly, I'm referring to him, but he doesn't have the powers at that point, but he has magical powers in the book. And uh, his magical powers, for anyone who knows the context, are to the, to the level that a, any normal person attacking him, a single punch from Dalen could go through someone, kill them instantly, okay? And as I'm seeing the fight scene begin, Dalen is fighting, fighting, and fighting, and is fighting, you know, regular bad guy thugs, and they're not dying, and they're not going down. And here was the issue. The fight choreography was still really, really good. The reason why, you know, the bad guys wasn't, weren't going down is because we wanted an impressive, more longer drawn out fight scene with really great stunts and all that stuff. So it was like, you know, some martial arts elements be, are being incorporated, but the context of this film is different to the context of, say, Legend of Drunken Master. In Legend of Drunken Master, the Drunken Master, Jackie Chan, is fighting people of comparable strength and durability as him. And so they're hitting as hard as he is, he's hitting as hard as they am, they're both not going down, and there establishes a, like a consistency within that universe of how durable these super martial artists are. That context doesn't exist in the short film. In the short film, Dalen is a superhuman fighting regular people, and one hit from him should have killed them, flat. And so it just did not make sense that these bad guys were not dying. That's a problem. And so then, was there a solution? Could there have been a way we could fix this to keep the cool factor? Because the fight scene was great. So we wanted the cool factor, yet we don't want that, huh? Because anyone who's familiar with the book and has read my book or even knows the context and they know that Dalen is, uh, has magical powers because it comes up in the short film as well, that anyone who's actually, you know, and you don't even need to pay attention sometimes to just have that question pop in your head, oh, it's taking a bit for him to kill these guys, isn't it? And we, that's a, you don't want the audience to say that. That's a problem. And so how do we solve it? Well, I took it as a challenge, but also it was an interesting, because this is, this is the thing that I've been saying for a while. Was there a way to solve it? And so I'm the author of the book. So luckily I know the, uh, the world building uh, and elements that aren't even in the book. And so I was able to delve into that wider pool of knowledge. And the line that we were able to insert at a perfect moment in the fight scene was simply Dalen looking at the bad guys getting up from his first attack against each of them and going, your son forged? And he looks to, you know, the person that he's talking to, who did you murder to do it? Even I didn't stoop that low. Now, I'm gonna cut there because I don't wanna to give too much away. The short film is gonna be very, very good. But sun forging is the magic that creates the weapons in the book. But there's an additional element to it that doesn't even come in the book, but is in the world building that I have already written that humans can actually get sun forged, but it was a lost technology. 
But I can tweak it a little bit and say that there is an imperfect version of human sun forging that still exists in this adaptation. And it's not good. The reason why it hasn't come up in the other you know, events in the book is because no one has been crazy enough to do it because it requires murdering a person. When it happens to you as an individual, you only live for an additional year and it affects cognitive function and there are other detrimental effects. So no one does it. But for crazies that want to get the effect, which is enhanced durability and strength, and they have something that they really want to do, they might be crazy enough to push it to that level. And I was personally happy with the line because it establishes that there is something different with these tugs around him. And then the context of what that change is, is shown by how tough they are in the fight scene. Because we're already know, we're already shown that something is different. They're Sunforged now. And then we get to see what that is from the progression of the fight scene itself. And it was answered with a single line. Just that. And that's sometimes all you need. And in factual fact, that, it, that line, I feel, has enhanced the scene in a dramatic way. It raises the tension. It means the main character is really getting challenged. And it justified us having a much cooler, elaborate fight scene. And this is the thing that I wanted to share with you, is that oftentimes you can have the cool factor. You can push it to where you want to do it, but you need to try and justify it if it's going to hang a problem in the air. I mean, another problem that we had, and I won't tell you how he answered that, you can wait for the short film, is uh, Imperius, okay? Because we had a reason why Dalen couldn't get Imperius at the beginning of the fight scene. But that thing happens later on. But then the choreography had to change through necessity, and that event happened later on in the fight. And the question is, okay, why doesn't Dalen summon Imperius at the beginning of the fight and just kill everyone because they, like, as durable as they are, they're not going to survive a slash from a super enchanted sword, are they? Well, that was another question that arose, and guess what? We found a simple solution that worked effectively in the narrative, and I can't wait for you to see it as well. You don't need to try and work with the rule of cool in such a way that you uh, already have something that is cool and you see a problem and need to fix it. You should actually try and address it as early on as possible, where you have this cool idea, and then you need to work with all the ways that you can, you can justify it and support it to uh, achieve what you want. This is exactly how Brandon Sanderson approached a lot of his uh, world building for his Stormlight series, Stormlight Archive series. And one of the cool factors, he wanted giant swords. He wanted really cool giant swords. Yet giant swords aren't necessarily practical and sometimes don't make sense. And so how could he justify you know, giant swords being used in a fantasy setting and he kind of worked backwards and he did a brilliant job. He was able to create monsters that were so big that required massive cutting ratios with these big swords to cut there and it all worked really, really well. And so this is probably the best way you can try and deal with the rule of cool is get the cool idea and then justify it. Work backwards from there to try and have a solid foundation which supports the cool factor from the very beginning. And Brandon works like that a lot. This is what he did when he hired me to consult for Stormlight Archives 4, A Rhythm of War. There is a scene where a character was fighting multiple opponents. And he sent me that chapter for the purposes of me looking at it to see if there were any errors with how the weapons were using. But there was an opportunity that I was just kind of suggested. I said, well, you know, if this character was really fighting multiple opponents, this weapon would work much, much better because it's made to have more crowd control. And I suggested, hit the character using a greatsword to swing it around and keep multiple opponents at bay. And then I also said, it could also look really, really cool because those dramatic wide sweeps would look amazing. And Brandon loved that idea. He took me up on it and he actually edited, rewrote that whole scene to incorporate the greatsword, not only to be more functionally realistic, but because it actually enhanced the cool factor as well. And some, so this is the other takeaway. Sometimes the answer you're trying to find to justify the coolness. And the cool factor he wanted was for this character to fight off multiple people. That was the cool. A big fight scene fighting against multiple people. And then what's a realistic way to pull it off? And the suggestion I had, Brandon felt, made it even cooler. And so isn't that, isn't that an awesome reality? Like sometimes when you actually do your due diligence to answer or figure out or justify the cool factor is a cool factor that just adds to it and makes it even better. There are some things that are too far gone to try and explain. Like the uh, Star Destroyers rising out of the ground. I, that one would, I'm not sure I could 
figure out a fix, a one-line fix for that. Um, and if I did, I would have to be something more elaborate that, you know, they had to be buried to avoid detection or something like that. They were active, but it doesn't work because the planet that they're on was a lost planet. And so they really wrote themselves into a corner with that one. Um, oh, the ships could have been like, the atmospheric conditions were so warped and strange, which was established in the movie, were so bad that their ships would have been destroyed if they were floating on the surface. And because they needed to hide there for years, ready for him to launch his attack, they had to be buried for safety and preservation of the ships, but they were there, ready to go. Where'd they get the crew then? There's still questions, but we're getting somewhere where we can answer that <laughs> massive one. But it can be done. That's my point, okay? And it was so amazing to experience this firsthand where I saw a plot hole and was like, we need to address it. And then being able to address it with a single line insert, like I've been saying all along, and then seeing how it enhanced the actual scene was brilliant. All right? And so that's the takeaway with the rule of cool. It's great. Use the rule of cool. We want the rule of cool. We want cool factor, okay? And sometimes you don't need to do it. You need to find the balance because sound and space, yeah, you can get away with it. But sometimes, depending on the tone of the story, it doesn't fit and you need to justify it. That's the thing. The more justified, the thing is, the, whatever that cool thing is, the more justified it is, the more satisfying it will be whenever it plays out because the audience is just gonna be along for the whole ride. And so I hope I've been able to help you understand the rule of cool just a little bit more uh, by sharing the first hand experience I was able to have, but also other examples as well. Thank you very much for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed it. And of course, I hope to see you here on the next video on Shadowversity. So until that time, Farewell.